Welcome to Gospel Tangents, the best source for Mormon history, science, and theology. I'm Rick Bennett. We're finalizing our conversation with Dr. Jason Olson. He's the author of The Burning Book. And uh, so this time we're going to talk a little bit about his beliefs about religious pluralism and also the rise of anti-Semitism. How does he deal with that? We'll also talk about his view of prophets and kind of get into some of his biblical studies and beliefs there. So you won't want to miss this conversation. Check it out. Right. And so I'll say here that, you know, I am in full support of what our church, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, is doing in religious pluralism. And that's, if, 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 if you've read the burning book, you have, Rick, you know, I am I'm a religious pluralist. I, I, I literally served as a, as a chaplain in the United States Navy. Well, that's where I wanted to, to go, people. yeah, yeah. Yep, ministering to people of all faiths, right? Do you have any kind words for Bruce R. McConkie and Mormon doctrine? I, I, I don't, I, I wrote about it in the burning book. <laughs> go to the book. Go to the book where I could. You, you could see it. Uh, um, yeah, I'm. A, I'm a religious pluralist. I think what we're doing with with Islam is wonderful. That we're we're according, we're reaching out the hand of of religious pluralism and acknowledging Muslims in their own faith tradition. What I ask for, and I think people like Trevin and and. Um, and certainly, uh, I, I, I definitely feel the brethren feel this way. With uh, they just invited Rabbi Ari Berman, who's the uh, the president of Yeshiva University, um, to speak at BYU. You know, and and I and so um, I'm I'm just so thrilled to see that we're reaching out the hand of religious pluralism to Judaism, right? Because y- you know that there's a history where of Jewish Christian relations where we have not uh, uh, res- acknowledged Judaism for its, on its own terms, right? That it, Judaism is its own religion that is legitimate mm-hmm. and valid, right? Um, but, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to see that we're doing that. Um, I think that, you know, when... Um, so, so anyway, I, and Trevin has always been that way, but there's, there's definitely... Latter-day Saint leaders and scholars who have not thought that way, you know, J. Reuben Clark and I was going perhaps to Bruce him. R. McConkie. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, and and that obviously bothers me, but um, but just to say, okay, Judaism is its own. Like I, I talked about the sign. Judaism is the Sinai Covenant. If I mean, if you want to simplify it, that's it. You know, God took a people out of Egypt. They were slaves, and he, he liberated them, and he brought them to Mount Sinai, and he made a covenant with the whole people, gave them commandments, and that covenant, God charged them to pass it from their children to their children's children, you know, for, for forever. Um, and that's Judaism. You're passing down that covenant from Mount Sinai. With, with its teachings and instructions and command, you know, Torah is instruction, right? It, it doesn't let, literally mean law. That's, <laughs> that's not, um, you know, chuk or, or chok is, uh, you know, that literally more means law in, um, in Hebrew. But Torah is literally instruction. It's, it's revelation. Here's a revelation that gives you instructions for how to, to keep this covenant um, that God made with the Jewish people on Mount Sinai. So that, that's, for me, that's Judaism. And, um, and it was pretty cool to see you know, the president of Yeshiva University say, you know, I represent a tradition that was revealed you know, by, by God to Moses uh, on Mount Sinai for thousands of years. And that, that's what I'm, I represent. I'm, I'm representing an ancient tradition. Um, that was pretty cool. And so anyway, I think... I think that's a that's a beautiful pluralistic conversation that I that I support. Now, yeah, so I would say Trevin, you know, he I appreciate him for appreciating that that we have something to learn from from Judaism as as a religion, not not just from uh, dead Jews. There's a you know a famous bestseller by Dara Horn called uh, "People Love Dead Jews," so I encourage people to to read it. Um, but we have to ask ourselves: Do we do we just love the, 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 the Jews of the Bible that are dead? Um, do we just feel sympathy for 
Holocaust victims. And, and Dara Horn has brilliant chapter about Anne Frank and how we've, you know, we've lifted Anne Frank, you know, I mean, wonderful story and, you know, tragedy, but, um, but she talks about how we've lifted Anne Frank and how we just neglect the stories of like Holocaust survivors, the, the Jews who, who lived and how this, you know, this strange phenomenon of how much we love dead Jews, you know, um, and uh, when there's living Jews that live in Israel, that live in America, that live in other places, and, you know, where's our interest in, in their lives? Um, uh, where, are we ascribing humanity to, to living Jews? Um, and, and that's really uh, what I, you know, and I write about in the burning book, uh, you know, are we treating people as objects? Um, are, Jews, are Jews just objects of the past? Are they objects of the prophetic or apocalyptic future, you know, that we're projecting, you know, our, our theology onto Jews or are Jews just living human beings that, you know, want to live in dignity? Um, so that, that's kind of my theory of how I approach anti-Semitism. And, um, but that, that moment at, at BYU, <laughs> I never felt more... Um, disconnected from being a Latter-day Saint because it stirred up, you know, Jewish identity, Jewish nationalism, Judaism itself. Like, how did we get, how did we go this, this far in the wrong direction to come to this point where you've got Latter-day Saint students who think that it's okay for Hamas to fire rockets on, on Israeli towns? You know, I mean, how do you get there? Well, can you comment on on the the broader movement? You know, that seems like if I remember right, it, was it Charlottesville where we had all these guys with tiki torches? Jews will not replace us. I mean, this is a. It seems like anti-Semitism, especially over the last five years, ten years, has 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 gotten worse. You know, it seemed like it was going a lot better, and now we're having a backlash. Do you have any comments on that? Yeah, I mean, so that's, um, you know, so I, I think about kind of the far right wing and the far left wing anti-Semitism. So when you talk about Charlottesville and Jews will not replace us, you know, that comes right out of uh, the, uh, the white genocide theory. Um, and it, this anti-Semitic belief that, you know, conspiracy that, that Jews are, are trying to dilute or destroy the white race. <laughs> and so... Because um, Jews aren't white, apparently, right? Because <laughs> Jews are not white, but then you've got the people on the far left who say that Jews are the worst white people because they are the colonialists and the, um, the white supremacists. I'll, I'll give you one quick tangent. Um, when you look at uh, Sterot, which is where at those, in those days where most of the, the Hamas rocket attacks... The, they didn't have rockets that could reach Tel Aviv yet, right? In in those those old days, but Shterot was built by uh, uh, Moroccan, mostly by Moroccan Jews, <laughs> and uh, and other Jews from uh, from the Middle East. So, if you have this paradigm that you know Jews are white people who are uh, you know colonialist taking Palestinian land, and the Palestinians are the brown people, where Hamas is is firing rockets on the town, the poor towns that are built by the, the brown Jews, the, the, the Jews that are from Arab countries. <laughs> you know? So, you know what I mean? So it's, you know, so to, to think in those terms is ridiculous because it's literally brown on brown violence, right? Right. Brown Hamas Palestinians firing rockets on brown Moroccan Jews. And why do they leave, you know, or... And other Jews from Arab countries. You know why are why did they leave? Because these Arab countries, after the establishment of the state of Israel, forced all their Jews to leave. Right, mm -hmm. and so they where was the only country that would give them immediate citizenship? Well, Israel. So they went to you know that's that's how that. Uh, in any case, so it's it's so much more complicated than, and it gets even more complicated in the American context. Um. 
Yeah, because these far right, far right anti Semites, you know, it's basically the same ideology as Nazism. And, um, you know, because Jewish people in the diaspora have found it hard to move around in the diaspora and to, you know, get or keep citizenship in, uh, in the diaspora, you know, and as you may know, in Nazi Germany, you know, Jews were stripped of their citizenship before they were led to the gas chambers. So, so Jews have always been in the diaspora have been kind of, you know, on the left when it comes to immigration, because they, you know, that's how they, that's how they got in. Um, even my own ancestors, if it wasn't for a little bit, a uh, little bit on the left immigration policies, my ancestors wouldn't have even gotten into America. They would have just stayed in Bogopol, Ukraine, which that shtetl was wiped out by the Nazis. So I, you know, I wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for some, you know, some, some bleeding heart liberals who wanted to let some poor Jews in. You know what I mean? Um, so typically, you know, American Jews are, for the most, you know, there's exceptions, but I feel, you know, a little, little liberal on immigration, and they want to let, they support, you know, brown people, black people, you know, non-whites to, to come into America. And um, if you're a white supremacist, you know, you hate that because you want to, you know, you want to create a white ethno, ethno state, right? So, um, and, and the Jews are, you see the Jews is wanting to uh, have human diversity, and, um, you know, that, oh, you know, the Jews are ascribing humanity to black people and brown people. And those Jews see the image of God in these non-white people. So that, 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 that's a problem. You got to, got to get rid of them so that we can, we can have a, a pure, you know, Aryan state. And I mean, it's the same, um, I mean, that's what I see as the heart of it is, and that's what uh, later on got me into the teachings of Abraham Joshua Heschel, who, as you, as you know, stood with Martin Luther King Jr. for civil rights. Because Heschel was, when he, he was a Holocaust survivor, and almost all his family perished in Europe. But when he got to America, you know, he was still fighting the Holocaust, right? And he saw it in the white supremacist regime, you know, in the United States, and literally, you know, viewing black people as, as not, not human. So Heschel gave himself to that. And he's, that's why he had that alliance with Martin Luther King Jr. Because it was all of, at, the, at the core of it was that black people are human beings created in the image of God. And we, you know, we, ha- we have to, it's a religious obligation to, um, to work for their equal rights. So I mean that's in a very very basic nutshell that's that's what uh I think a lot of Jewish people have brought to America to make America better. Mm-hmm. Um and and that's a I mean I I in my view is a fundamental American value that whatever race you are, whatever religion you are, whatever your national origins, you're a child of God. You're created in the image of God and you should have a ro- you know you should have a path to equal citizenship. Not, not, you know, I'm a believer in equal opportunity. You, you can't enforce equal outcome, but, you know, everybody should have equal opportunity. And um, so, I mean, I still, still think like that, I guess, as an American Jew, I still um, obviously oppose, you know, this, you know, white supremacist anti-Semitism on the far right. But um, there's also anti-Semitism on the far left, which is, you know, Jews should not have a nation. You know, Jews, Jews are undeserving of their own country. Um, I think that's, that's, uh, that's the anti-Semitism of the far left. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's of a different nature. Do you, do you have anything to say, like, because I know one of the big thing, well, I think kind of the two big issues in Israel right now are um, annexing Palestinian territories and and. Israeli settlements. I think that's one issue. And then the other one is it just seems like, you know, my understanding, which may not be good, there's basically two Palestinian areas 
And sometimes you can't even, I think you mentioned this in your book, You can't, like a, a, a Christian living in a Palestinian area couldn't even get to church because of the Israeli checkpoints. And so there's no freedom of movement. Um, I mean, is is there a problem with, could, could the state of Israel handle that issue and settlements in a better way? Well, um, it's a tough question. Uh, you know, the, the policies have become what they are for a reason. Um, and I am, I'm of com- complete support that it's fair to criticize policies and to try to get, try to get better policies, right? Um, I, I would say, I mean, the fundamental, the fundamental uh, paradigm that I look at all of it is, uh, is Jews are human beings deserving of a life of dignity and Palestinians are human beings deserving a life of dignity. So, um, you know, religious freedom for Palestinians, freedom to worship, freedom to move, um, you know, freedom to, to be, to be, uh, have, have dignity. Um, you know, I, to me, those are, I subscribe to a, a branch of Jewish interpretation that affirms all of that. Um, and, and, and going back to Abraham Joshua Heschel and as a, as a fundamental, um, I'm I'm actually in touch with one of the the one of the the the, the best Israeli scholars who's trying to bring uh, Heschel's teachings to Israel, and he's tra- translated. Um, I mean, I, I'll give him a plug. His his name's uh, Doctor Dror Bondi. Um, if you if if anybody wants to look him up, but he's trying to bring Abraham Joshua Heschel's teachings to Israeli culture. Um, this this idea that. Um, did the way that Abraham Joshua Heschel looked at black people in America, could that be translated to the way Israeli Jews could view Palestinians, right? Um, now, it's, it's tricky because there's a war, <laughs> you know? That's something that we have to acknowledge. It's, it's a, a lot of times it's a cold war, right? Um, it, there's not open... Hostility, but you, as you see, like every couple of years, there's there's a war between uh, Israel and Hamas. So it's complicated, um, and and the Israel's war with Hamas is not a war that Israel wants. Um, if you go to Israel and you just go and talk to most everyday Israelis, you know, and I met a lot of Israeli soldiers. I mean, you know, I, I mean, I went on the birthright trip with them, but I kept in touch with them. And uh, I went to the beach with them in Tel Aviv. You know, they don't want to be, you know, patrolling in, in uh, Palestinian territories. Now, who wants to do that? If you're 18, 19, 20, 20 years old, you don't want to be patrolling, you know, dangerous streets where the people don't want you there. They don't, they don't want to be there. They want to, they want to go to the beach and hang out with their family and their friends and uh, play games and go to school and, and live their dreams, have a family. They, they don't want to be, you know, they don't want to be running a military administration in, uh, in Palestinian territories. I, I, I mean, I, I can, just from my own human experience, that's, that's the, the big, the most important thing. And and the Palestinians, you know, they don't want the Israel, you know, Israeli soldiers patrolling their streets either. So, you know, why can't it just end? And um, I think both sides really want that to end. But uh, you know, technically, as a scholar, right? And I didn't have these tools when I was at that uh, BYU class, you know, um, in two thousand nine. I just. I just had emotion, right? And I just, I'm disgusted with you. Um, but I, I have, you know, I have scholarly expertise now. You know, the, the Oslo Accords, which I very much believe in, that, that whole process, I mean, it's, it's very old now. But... Uh, yeah, that was under Bill Clinton, right? The 90s? Yeah. Yeah. But the Oslo Accords, I still, personally, 
I'm only speaking for myself. I'm not, I'm not speaking for the U.S. government. I'm not speaking for anybody but my own scholarly opinion uh, as someone who, who got a doctorate in the field. Academic opinion. So let me preface that. But, you know, the, uh, the Oslo Accords was trying to manage the, the situation. And you have uh, Area A, which is uh, Palestinian uh, security controlled and Palestinian uh, civil control, right? And so um, I don't have all the, the percentages off the top of my head, but um, those Area A portions of Judea and Samaria or the West Bank, depending on your political leanings, those Area A, you know, Palestinians have a, uh, a, uh, a degree of self-determination, right? They can, they have their own police, they, um, their, their own law enforcement, they have their own judges, uh, judicial system, they have their own mayors. And so those Area A portions, um, I think are, I think, I think, uh, I mean, obviously, I think Israel should respect those, and um, and that's what was agreed. Um, sometimes there's terrorist problems, and and terrorists are going in and, and killing is, Israelis, and Israeli military has to go into Area A, and that's very tragic. But if you you know if there's a terrorist problem and you're trying to stop it, you you know you gotta you gotta sometimes go into territories you don't want to go into and and uh, solve the problem. <clears throat> and, and, you know, in Area B, there is Israeli um, security control and Palestinian civil control. So, you know, Palestinians still have their own judicial system and they can go to their own judges. They, can, they have their own political leadership, their own mayors and, and whatnot. But the uh, Israeli, uh, Israeli law enforcement or Israeli military is still present in the area B, and um, in the area B, are majority Palestinian territories, um, and the way I look at it is, you know, I, I I am, I am an American, you know, Democrat in the sense of uh, you know lowercase D. Like I I believe, you know, I believe you should have democracy, right? And um, so if there's Palestinian majority. You know, they the Palestinians should have some self determination. So I do hope. I mean, personally, that uh, just that you know, Area B will Palestinians will have more self determination over time, and that um, they'll they'll be able to uh, have security control over Area B uh, in time, and they'll be able to, you know, they'll they'll be able to live live lives of dignity and not have you know not have Israeli police or mil Israeli military there so that they can just live their lives. Area C is really complicated, really complicated. Um, and uh, Area C uh, does not have a lot of Palestinians. Um, so, but it does have quite a few, it has all the, the Jewish settlements Israeli settlements in, in Area C. And, um, I mean, under the Oslo Accords, I, I think that Israel was, it was able to do that. It was unclear because Israel has both, uh, you know, security and uh, civilian control of Area C. That was, that was agreed in the Oslo Accords on, with, the, with the Palestinians, with the Palestinian Liberation Organization. So Area C is, is complicated, and um, personally, I think there are some good security arguments why uh, Israel wants to have um, military bases and um, presence in the, the Jordan River Valley. I mean, this is getting into very technical stuff, but, um, you know, is, <laughs> Israel's fought a lot of wars, and countries from from the east have invaded it and tried to destroy it. So, you know, Israel wants to have what's called some strategic depth to have 
at least uh, some military control of territory um, to be able to protect its its borders and protect itself from invasion. Um, you know, just you can read in the news that Iran, which is to Israel's east, still wants to destroy the state of Israel and wipe it off the, the map. So, you know, you can understand why why Israel might be hesitant to to give up its uh, control of, of any um, military control of any eastern territories by you know especially by the, the Jordan River because uh, it you know it, it it could very well still get invaded from the east so purely from uh, from that even just totally secular point of view you're trying to uh, the state is, exists in a way to prevent another holocaust so when you've got you know when you've got iran threatening a, a second holocaust um it's it's a, it's a little complicated but mm-hmm. all that said um so area c is complicated <laughs> areas and uh, i'm not going to take a position on that because uh, it's just not in my my purview but um all i would say is just israel's trying to keep the status quo for a reason and um but all that said, I do want a future, especially for Palis- the, the majority of the Palestinians. I think it's 2.8 million Palestinians are in Area A and Area B. And I, and I, I do believe and support in a future where the Palestinians could, could ca- have as much self-determination, uh, have as much autonomy, have as much uh, human rights, um, freedom, dignity as, as, as absolutely possible. Um, I don't know what that's going to look like, but, uh, um, I, and I certainly want Israel to, um, remain a Jewish and democratic state, (laughs) right? I mean, that's, so, uh, even as uh, purely as an American, I support Israel's declaration of independence. It's a, it's an amazing document if you look at it. Um, and I, you know, I hope Israel can live up to its highest ideals as found in the uh, Declaration of Independence. But, um, you know, for Israel to, re- to be both Jewish and democratic, it's got to, right, it's got to, uh, it, necess- it can't annex all these, it certainly cannot annex Area A and Area B. Because then, if you're going to be a democracy, you've got to give everybody citizenship, right? So, mm-hmm. um, and they're going to vote. You know, they're going to, and so... I do support, uh, I, personally, just academically speaking, I support Israel's um, goal to, to keep a Jewish majority. Because if you keep a Jewish majority, you could keep the state Jewish and you could keep the law of return so that you know, the Jews that are, are fleeing Russia or Ukraine right now, they, they have somewhere they could go to be safe. And you, you've got to, if you're going to have Jewish self-determination, you've got to, have a Jewish majority. Otherwise, and, and that's what Zionism is all about, is, is the Jewish people have, uh, controlling their own destiny. So, um, so that, that, it's very complicated. I mean, you, you're pro- it's, it's probably, uh, this, you know, it takes taken me years and years and years and years of study just to, to break it down in this way. And I hope, I hope it's clear, but um, so I, I th- I, you know, I, I see that that's kind of the, uh, I can't. I can't take any clear policy position, but I know I'm. I'm speaking in, in very generic terms, but th- but that's uh, that's how I see this kind of kind of playing out in a way that we can uh, acknowledge the humanity of both sides. So, is that? Do you have any other questions about that? Or I, I, I do, I, but I, I want to move on to other topics. Okay, <laughs> sure. Um, so I always like to talk to people with, uh, divinity degrees, Jewish studies degrees, religious degrees, that sort of thing. And, um, so, you know, I, I've recently had some conversations about biblical literalism. Um, there was one of my favorite rabbi, I, I've never met him, but he's one of my favorites is Rabbi David Wolpe. I think he's from Los Angeles. And, uh, I watched a video he did decades ago, but it really struck me on the Exodus. And he said, 
Well, and this kind of ties into the documentary hypothesis as well. But but he said the Exodus didn't happen the way the Bible says it happened. <laughs> you know, ah. there's, and so there's a little, and so you know, I I remember another scholar in this same video said that there's not one shred of evidence of the Exodus ever happening. Um, you know, and that Moses is kind of a myth, and you know, and then we have, or or if he's not a myth, he's maybe he was a real person, but there's been so many stories told the parting of the Red Sea didn't never happen. I mean, and I, and I know there are other people who have tried to explain it, but but my question is, you know, how much, especially the first five books of Moses, how much of that can we say is historical? Uh, because up until Josiah. I don't think there's really any well-documented history from the first five books of Moses. Would you agree with that? I lean a bit more toward biblical literalism, actually. <laughs> um, I can acknowledge that, uh, you know, we, we don't have, you know, archaeolo- archaeological evidence of the Exodus or... Um, of the revelation at Mount Sinai, um, or that we know for sure where it is. Uh, but despite that, you know, and I, I, I've studied the, the archaeology, you know, the archaeological arguments and all that, but, uh, but I, you know, I do believe, um, I do believe that it all happened, (laughs) you know, um, you know, and I, I, I do, I actually think it's, you know, it it is kind of kind of complicated as a Latter Day Saint because, you know, critics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints make a lot of, you know, arguments against the Book of Mormon um, with similar tools and, you know, where's the archaeological evidence for this? Where's the archaeological evidence for that? Uh, historical evidence, textual evidence, um, but for the Exodus and the Revelation at Mount Sinai. Um, yeah, I do believe that that, that that happened. Um, I don't know where it happened. Uh, there, Jewish tradition itself admits that, um, something very transcendental happened. Um, I I mean, you could go into the deepest Jewish sources that at Mount Sinai, um, I, I mean, even a Jewish teaching is at Mount Sinai, the children of Israel literally overcame the fall of Adam and Eve. And uh, they became as angels when they heard the voice of God and they received uh, the Torah. Um, So, you know, I mean, and and as you know, Jewish tradition is open to many different interpretations. Uh, So even from a Latter-day Saint language, you know, using Latter-day Saint language, you know, what were the children of Israel... Um, taken into heaven for a temporary period uh, like Enoch. I mean, in our own Latter-day Saint tradition, we have, you know, Enoch's city of Zion was, was taken into heaven um, and, you know, wasn't actually in history, um, but transcended history itself. So I, I'm open to those different interpretations, but for me, I, I know that, that, that something happened, that... Um, there were, you know, the 12 tribes of Israel, the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and they, they were, his, you know, actually slaves in Egypt. And, um, and Moses took them out, and, uh, and, all, and those mar- I do believe those miracles happened. And, um, but as far as that revelation at Sinai, you know, was that, you know, was that a transcendental experience, or was that... Uh, was that a historical experience in, in the sense that it was was um, was concrete at a at a literal mountain? Um, to me, I'm, I'm not bothered by the question at all. I, I, I but there was something radical that happened, and there was a there was definitely I believe there was a historical Moses, and he received you know a Torah that was revolutionary. And that um, that changed the paradigm of how a society and a civilization should should live itself out. And I've studied, you know, I've studied the the Canaanites and the Phoenicians and the 
the Assyrians and um, the uh, uh, Ugarit and um, you know and, and all those uh, all those Mes- all other Mesopotamian texts. You know, I have my ancient Near East texts, um, and and I'll, I've, I've studied Egypt. Um, nothing compares. There there are similarities, but nothing truly compares. I I think to the righteousness and the morality uh, and and the the uh, the innovation of the Torah. I think it's 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 it is unique in the ancient Near East. So to me, that actually strengthens my belief that it, that the Torah was a revelation. Um, and um, so I mean, does that kind of get it where you're you're going? Well, let but, me <laughs> let me ask another question. Yeah. Um, yeah. The the flood was it a worldwide flood or was it just a large localized flood? Do you have an opinion on that? I I I'm I'm not, I I I think that because there's other flood traditions, you know, Enuma Elish, and um, there seems to be a human memory of floods in other civilizations. I I believe that um, yeah that it was it was a global global flood, and um, and Noah started over. I mean. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, so, yeah, I guess I, I, I lean pretty, uh, I lean pretty orthodox. Um, okay. I, I mean, I would have. How about the book if, of Esther yeah. and Ruth? Or I've heard that a lot of people believe, and Job is another one, that those three books are fiction. <laughs> they never have <happened>, those <laughs> anachronisms. Would, would you agree or disagree with that? Well, you could, you could have. I'm open to the idea of biblical fiction that you know you could create you could create a fictional character in order to illustrate um divine truth. Um you know, I mean we have uh we have had general authorities that wrote books of fiction, you know. Um uh, you know, I mean <laughs> Paul Dunn comes to mind. <laughs> yeah, I mean Are you familiar with Paul Dunn? Uh I'm familiar with him. I I I I don't think I've read much of his stuff, but I mean, for example, like the work in the glory, right? It's, uh, you know, it, it's t- it's teaching, you know, it's... Well, yeah, but that's a historical yeah. fiction. I mean, Paul Dunn, yeah. I remember when he spoke, I was young, like, I can remember having tears, and he would just tell these really, like he was a minor league baseball player, which wasn't really true, and, and yeah. he would, was in the army, but which wasn't really true. Like, all the stories he told oh, in general okay. conference... You know, and then he he got released, and there's a book ah, by uh, uh. Lynn Packer, I think, that talks about all the lies, basically, that he represented in in general conference. Like he was one of the most famous, most emotional speakers ever, and then he kind of, you know, <laughs> all the all the yarns came undone, and and he he's kind of like, oh, Paul Dunn, he's a bad guy, um, so. I, I mean, the work in the glory, that's, that's marketed as fiction. I mean, you get tennis shoes in, in, among the Nephites. That's marketed as fiction. But yeah, when, you know, I mean, here's, here's the issue with Esther and Ruth. You know, a lot of people want to say those are fiction, but, but supposedly David and Jesus, their ancestors were Ruth and Esther. <laughs> so yeah. if you say, well, the stories didn't exist, why is Jesus related to two fictional characters? I mean, that's the question. Well, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I'm, I lean towards biblical literalism, so I, uh, I'm not offended if people have a different opinion, um, but I just, uh, I believe that the biblical writers were, were serious people and were, were prophets. Um, you know, we could get into authorship and all those things, but, um, you know, I, I tend to, I believe that the biblical writers were honest and they were trying to convey to their people um, the record and the truth and what actually happened the best as they knew it. I, I, I don't believe that the biblical writers were trying to deceive anybody. Um, you know, could they, could they get something wrong or misunderstand um, uh, history? I mean, I mean, are we saying that the biblical writers were historians? That's not their purpose. They're not, 
they they, they were they were they were prophets. A prophet and a historian are are two different things. Now, as Latter Day Saints, we believe they should be fused because because Mormon was a historian and a prophet. But that doesn't mean that all the prophets are historians, right? They have visions and you know and dreams, and they record those things. So, you know, they they have transcendental experiences that that are not that don't properly belong to history at all. So, um, and, and that's where I'm at. I mean, I would, I I, I guess you could argue. I I mean, I've never even thought of this, but I'm both I'm both a mystic and a historian. <laughs> I mean, I actually I have been trained as a historian, but I'm also a mystic. I'm, I mean, in in the in the technical sense of the term. I mean, that's, you know, the burning book. <laughs> the burning book is, is a mystical story. Yeah. Um, you know, could you prove as a historian that, that I, I heard the voice of God when I tried to burn the Book of Mormon? No, it's not, it's not in the realm of history. But it's a transcendental experience. It's a mystical experience. And for me, that's real. So... Um, well, you know, other stories come yeah. up like the, the I mean, I, I talked to Kobe Townsend. Um, the, there's the story about the walls of Jericho that was supposedly, you know, they marched around the city seven times and then the walls fell down. Well, Colby says that um, basically there was a wall and it was on one side of the city and it was to collect wall. And, and the city was like 300 years old at, at the time that the the story was written. And so the Jews were like, just kind of made up this story about marching around seven times because there was no wall. I mean, it, it, there was yeah. a wall, but it didn't surround the whole city. And so, you know, it calls into question the whole, I mean, is this just a myth? That, yeah. And, and No, I mean, these are good questions. And I, you know, um, I respect everybody's opinion. I think where the rubber hits the road is did the covenants actually happen? Right, and that's where you're going to get people in in faith crisis, and uh, you know where where secularism just takes you too far. Um, and that's why I'm I'm insistent. The covenant that God made with the uh, with the children of Israel on Mount Sinai, um, and you know, and he he made a covenant with the children of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, where where God swore an oath to them. And they, you know, they said we will uh, listen and we will obey. Uh, to me, that really happened. That covenant happened. So, um, and it's real and enduring. Um, like I said, if they were literally on the earth or they were taken into heaven to make the covenant, it's, uh, I'm okay with either interpretations. But um, if we don't have that foundation as members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, then... You know, how are we going to take uh, baptism covenant seriously, temple covenant seriously? Um, I mean, to me, the Book of Mormon interprets the Bible. So if Book of Mormon writers say, hey, this is how the Exodus happened, and, you know, and there, there was manna, and there was uh, the parting of the Red Sea, and there was 40 years in the wilderness, and there were revelation and instruction, well, that's what the Book of Mormon writers say, and, you know, and... Um, so I, I mean, I guess I'm looking, I'm projecting the Book of Mormon back onto the Bible. Um, and that's how I've always been. Even when I studied, you know, Hebrew Bible academically at BYU, that was always my interpretation. But again, if I wasn't a Latter-day Saint and I, I was, wasn't called through the Book of Mormon, I would be an Orthodox Jew. Like I'm just, I'm just an Orthodox kind of guy. So, <laughs> um... You know, so that's that's music to the to the ears of you know your your more conservative scholars at BYU. But probably I have people that that don't like that. But um, I certainly get along well with with the brethren because I'm I'm just I just I believe in prophets. I uh, I believe in ancient prophets. I believe in living prophets. Um, from from in my journey, that's what I was always searching for was I'm reading about Moses in the Torah and, uh, you know, Korach rebels against him and he gets swallowed up. But 
I started having questions about, well, I want a, I want a Moses today. I want a modern day Moses. Where is, where is our Moses today? We've got, you know, we've got all these wonderful the rabbis. The Orthodox would say in Salt Lake City, Utah. <laughs> you know, so, um, you know, and I mean, there's some interesting things and, and there are branches of modern day Judaism that believe prophecy is still available. I don't know if, if you're curious about that, but uh, oh. Judaism is one of those religions that acknowledges that, that modern prophecy is, is possible. So that's, anyway, we could get into a lot of, right, you know, serving as a missionary and people just rejecting me out, you know, rejecting the message outright. You know, modern prophecy is, is unavailable. You know, it's a, you know, a Bible, a Bible, we've already got a Bible, right? right. Um, but as a Jew, you know, that's why I say, um, I mean, I don't know, it could be offensive to people, but I'm not a Messianic Jew. Um, I, I would... I would uh, define myself as a prophetic Jew. I'm a Jew who needs prophets, um, who believes in prophets. And that's why I'm also willing to acknowledge that, uh, you know, I've been warned, I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say Abraham Joshua Heschel was a prophet, but I, as I read his writings, I, I believe Abraham Joshua Heschel tapped into prophecy. You know, so... Uh, and I can't deny, and I wrote about that in, in uh, the burning book when I read right. Heschel's The Prophets. Um, and I, 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 yeah, I mean, he, he was able to gain prophetic insight into the situation in America, right? Um, the problems of injustice. And I, I mean, for me, that's, that's what a prophet does is, uh, it, it, you know, calls people to repentance is, is, uh, Anyway, I, for anybody, I highly recommend Abraham Joshua Heschel, The Prophets, the most clear, you know, well-written introduction to what is a prophet and what are they, what are they supposed to do. Um, and that's, yeah, so I mean, I'm, I'm a prophetic Jew. So, I mean, I, I mean that's, uh, and, and that's led me into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Uh, so I, I guess, uh, but, you know, I mean, it, it is a matter of faith. You know, I can't... Um, and and I, I do differentiate between faith and, uh, you know, maybe perhaps secular uh, academic investigation. You know, I support both, but some, you know, some some things we just can't prove. And, and you know, and, and again, biblical writers are not historians, so... Um, they they weren't intending to be. I mean, maybe they were trying to be. And chronicles, you could argue. I mean, that's supposed to be history, literally chronicles. Uh, but prophecy is. I I believe in prophecy. I just I would argue that prophecy is separate from history, and um, and prophecy is not just seeing the future. It's prophecy is insight and revelation into human nature as it exists now. You know what are you know that, and 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 you could you could even read Heschel, and you could you could see that, see that. I mean, uh, um, how, how does prophecy is how does God feel about what human beings are doing right now? You know, how does God feel about it? That's prophecy. Uh, I mean, at, at the bare minimum. The, I mean, yeah. you could the pathos of God, or um, and God exists outside of time, and outside of history itself. So we're, we're, we're talking about, really, it's, it's complex. When God reveals truths, he's not bound by history even. So, um, but, I, yeah, but, but I, 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 I allow God the right to, to reveal truth as he, as he wishes to us. Um, I've always believed that. Uh, so, in any case, that's, that's where I stand, but... Okay. Well, I know it's getting late, and I uh, appreciate you because I know you get up very early. Um, in fact, it's tomorrow where you live. <laughs> That's right. I'm in the future, so That's right. <laughs> I'll tell you what happens in America today. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> 
So, Jason Olson, I just want to thank you uh, so much for being on Gospel Tangents. I forgot to bring my book, but I have a book. I wish I could get you to sign it, but you're in Korea. And by the way, are, you're friends with Greg Pavone, I think, right? Yes. In Korea? Yeah. Yes, wonderful, so, uh, wonderful friend. And Casey Kern, I think. And yeah, so... So shout out to Casey and Greg. Hopefully you guys watch this. And uh, um, But I just want to thank you so much for being here on Gospel Tangents. And I'm going to give away, pretend I'm holding the book here, the morning book. <laughs> I'm going to give away a, a copy to, to one of my listeners. So uh, thank you. Make, make sure you, you uh, get in that, that drawing. So. so thanks again for being here on Gospel Tangents. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. It's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Dr. Jason Olson. Jason, thank you so much for getting up so early in Korea. And uh, it was a nice time for me, but I know it was very early for you. Kind of a little bit back to the future. So anyway, thanks a lot for sharing your testimony and for indulging my questions on uh, biblical questions. So really appreciate that. In our next conversation, I'm excited to introduce Dr. Paul Reeve. We're going to talk about his latest book, which talks about the priesthood ban. So this is uh, Isaac Manning, Isaac Lewis Manning, uh, Jane Manning, James' brother, uh, who converted to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Connecticut um, within a few months of Jane's conversion, uh, a part of her family that embraced the gospel, and he... Uh, went to Nauvoo with Jane and the rest of the family, became a cook for Joseph Smith in the Nauvoo Mansion House. And then um, at the murder of Joseph and Hiram, uh, Isaac dug four graves. He dug two graves that were decoy graves where caskets filled with sand were buried because they were afraid that uh, the mobs that killed Joseph and Hiram would come back and desecrate the bodies. And then he dug the actual graves where the bodies were buried at the Joseph Smith homestead. Thanks for listening to Gospel Tangents. If you'd like to support me, please subscribe at gospeltangents.com or on patreon.com slash gospeltangents, or you can watch entire videos at youtube.com slash gospeltangents. I really can't do this without your support. I'd love to do it full time, and I need a lot more people that are willing to, to help me out. So. I'd really appreciate that. So thanks again for listening and don't forget to check out some of our other videos.